I'm going to just t- start by talking very briefly about the book, uh, and then I'm going to read a couple of extracts and talk around them uh, a little bit, and then I think um, and I'm going gonna... to grill you on some of the things you've written. <laughs> Um, the book came out on June the, th- June the 1st, and two weeks later, the Grenfell fire happened. And that has changed everything for the way housing is, operates and the context within housing is situated in London and actually across the country, um, I, I would say. What I think Grenfell highlighted is actually it made visible lots of the themes that were invisible and I was trying to show in this book. And chief among them um, have been lack of accountability and a complete failure to listen to local communities. So the biggest tragedy of Grenfell is that it was predicted repeatedly local Grenfell Action Group had said that actually, you know, safety standards were not being maintained. They had actually said that it would take a catastrophe like this for them to be listened to. And the demolition of housing estates against community wishes, which is happening all across London, actually reflects the same lack of accountability and total failure of democracy. The other key theme is regulation and an ideological commitment against regulation which we've seen by this government especially since uh, 2010 and I write about it particularly here with the deregulation of the private rented sector and the terrible conditions that exist in aspects of the private rented sector and actually now Uh, one third of all social housing tenants live in private rented accommodation which is some of the most terrible uh, conditions uh, in housing at hugely uh, inflated uh, prices and you might have expected actually that a fire would occur in some of these uh, uh, some, some, some of this housing and some of the illegal structures even that actually thousands of beds and sheds which exist but it happened in what was in fact local authority well it was arm's length local authority uh, housing that again is part of the democratic uh, deficit and it happened in Kensington one of the richest parts uh, of the country one of the richest parts of the world really and a fireman actually said that he would expect something like that to happen in a third world slum uh, not in a place like Kensington so Grenfell's changed everything and of course it's the worst tragedy and disaster imaginable but I think it has also provided a context where actually at the end of the book I say I think the only thing that really can change the way we approach housing is a paradigm shift in our political culture and I think it's provided that uh, uh, backdrop uh, possibly for that to to take place. Okay so I'm going to just read a couple of extracts Uh, The first extract I'm going to read is just from the introduction from the beginning of the book. And the theme I want to bring out here is that what I'm really trying to stress in the book is that actually what happens at the very top of the housing market, the super prime properties, the alpha elites, all the billionaires, that is directly connected to what happens at the very bottom of the market, the terrible conditions, the lack of accountability. You know, very often people say, you know, what's wrong with having the most billionaires in the world in London? Surely that's a good thing. They bring jobs, they stimulate the economy, you know, they provide London with something that no other city has. What I'm trying to show here actually is that there is a direct link and it's based on this new property-based economy, which means that actually in today's economy, the income from capital is greater, the income from rent is greater than the income from uh, Uh, growth or wages and that's the main theme from uh, Thomas Piketty's um, seminal book Capital in the 21st uh, Century which of course I you know sort of clearly give a give a nod to here so this is the first um, extract that I'll read from and this opens with a quote actually from someone I know this is someone I've known for about 20 years, a friend of mine for for the last 20 years. And she posted this on her Facebook page uh, just uh, as I was finishing writing the book. And as soon as I saw this post, I thought, this has got to go in the book. And I thought it was such a powerful quote, I actually started the book with it. 
surrounded by boxes yet again, about to move, knowing that we will be moving again in the new year. I have cleaned and painted the new flat and it's still a dump with damp patches and a moth-eaten carpet throughout. I am 46 and I have lived in over 30 houses and I still have no security. This was posted on social media at the end of 2016 by Jan. She has a good job, earning almost 40,000 a year. Her husband works full time, they have two children, and this is what she has to put up with. In the adverts on the hoardings all over the city is, an un is another London, populated by smart looking people and luxury back balcony apartments. This is the destination of choice for foreign investors and the new global elite of oligarchs, billionaires and the super rich who make up the so-called alpha elites who are attracted by the UK's very favourable tax environment. Entire neighbourhoods in the alpha parts of London, St John's Wood, Highgate, Hampstead, Notting Hill Gate, Kensington, to name but a few, have changed out of all recognition over the last decade. Estate agents refer to these centrally located super prime areas as the golden postcodes. They have long been wealthy places, home to moneyed communities from all over the world, as well as the English upper classes. But in the past, like most of London, they were also mixed areas. Now, even the wealthy are displaced from Kensington by multi-millionaire, ultra high net worth individuals, who uh, apparently the definition of them is that you, they have to uh, possess more than $30 million, uh, who in turn place, displace others from central London to suburban areas, creating a domino effect that ripples throughout the city, with the consequence that average income earners and the poor move to the periphery or out of the capital altogether, placing pressure on houses and housing and prices around the country. So this is the process actually of trickle down, to borrow a phrase that Margaret Thatcher made so popular. Her idea was that if you brought lots of wealth into a place, uh, you created a finance centre in Docklands, for example, all the wealth would trickle down to the poorest parts that need it the most. The whole sort of rising tide floats all boats idea. But of course, this completely failed to happen. And it does, this, 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 this theory, this, this theory is, a great, is a great myth. Wealth does, in, does trickle down, but it doesn't actually go to poorer communities. It displaces them, displaces them uh, and, and pushes them out. I go on to say, the same circuits of global capital are also transforming San Francisco, New York and Vancouver in North America. European cities from Berlin to Barcelona and towns and cities in the UK from Bristol to Manchester and Margate to Hastings. This has led to a constant hum of debate about the impacts of that much misunderstood term, gentrification. But this isn't gentrification. It's another phenomenon entirely. And gentrification, which really was the term invent, uh, coined by Ruth Glass, the sociologist in the 1960s, to describe the process where uh, middle-class families moved into Islington and did up uh, workers' cottages and gradually over 30 years changed that area changed completely as did Notting Hill Gate. This was a process which took over a generation. What we're talking about here in London has actually happened within the space of less than 10 years since uh, the end of the financial crisis when we've seen this huge glut of finance capital come into London as a result of largely uh, quantitative easing, uh, our specific uh, planning policies and our policies towards property and our speculative house, house building model combined with the effects of uh, austerity uh, and the introduction uh, of the market into housing benefit, uh, which has had very deleterious uh, consequences. I don't know if I'm running over my allotted time. No, I have another on. extract I want to read you now. This is my favourite bit of the book. And this is, <laughs> this is, this is one of my favourite bits of the book. It's one of the bits of the book I enjoyed reading the most, and uh, writing the most. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not really, it's not a cheerful book in, in, in large part. But this bit actually I think is to an extent quite funny. This is the light relief. And in, in amongst all the doom and gloom. Although, of course, the real message isn't funny at all. But uh, this concerns my visit to uh, a place called the London Real Estate Forum, which is an annual property fair which happens in a 
marquee in Berkeley Square uh, every year. And I went there last uh, July. I managed to wangle myself a press pass and I met up with Ollie there, actually. And we both were like, oh God, this is hilarious. Anyway, I will now read to you what I wrote about it. International expos and property fairs are the meat and drink of the property industry. I managed to inveigle my way into the London Real Estate Forum, which is one of the property networking events of the year and a perfect illustration of how deals between developers, investors and local authorities are done. Organised by New London Architecture, a membership organisation for developers, architects and other related bodies, it takes place every year in a giant marquee in Berkeley Square in Mayfair at the heart of Super Prime London. I entered the marquee and saw a bar with a pyramid of filled champagne glasses at one end, while waitresses immaculately clad in black cocktail dresses and heels handed out sushi to delegates who milled around exhibition stands belonging to the likes of Southwark, Lambeth, Haringey, Croydon and Newham councils, who were advertising their wares in a slick and sophisticated marketing atmosphere light years away from the traditional image of the unglamorous local authority. Councils, working in partnership with developers, identify and earmark parts of the city for large-scale schemes and then tout them to the audience of global investors. As I walked around, I saw a local authority head of regeneration I knew and asked her why she was there, taking two days out of her busy schedule for the event. The reason we come is because everybody's here. If I talk to five investors today, then it's job done. Then we can choose who we work with, she explained. According to the website, <clears throat> the event brings together more than 2,000 foreign investors, property companies, local authorities and politicians, as well as armies and consult of consultants and PR people. Alongside the two-day networking event, a dizzying array of panel discussions and development showcases in specially erected conference rooms provided a PR opportunity for developers and local authorities to pitch to investors and to each other. The 180-acre development planned for Brent Cross in North London, the 15 developments in Newtown Centre at Elephant and Castle in South London, the Earl's Court development in West London and an unprecedented 28 sites in Newham in East London were just a handful of the 180 showcases featured. It seemed as if every inch of the capital was being parceled up and recreated in CGI images. Deirdre Ars Armsby, Director of Regeneration and Planning at Newham, described to delegates the astonishing number of sites in her borough ripe for development. We have the huge benefit in our borough of a young and accepting population ready to accept this scale of growth. One of these sites would be unusual. We have 28. <laughs> the huge opposition to plans by Newham to demolish the Carpenters' estate and the subsequent high-profile occupation of a flat of, on the estate by campaign group Focus E15 led to University College London pulling out of its joint venture to build a new campus on the site and challenges Armsby's account of Newham's accepting population. But at this particular gathering, the only note of dissent came from councillor Ken Clark, who said somewhat bashfully, it is magnificent what we're doing in East London, and I am honored to play a role as the cabinet member for regeneration. But there is the question of affordability. I know that's a bit of a social issue to raise in this environment. <laughs> His comment, which was not followed up by anyone in the room, was the only attempt made to link the tsunami of investment and regeneration with the housing affordability crisis. Sitting down at lunchtime for sandwiches of rare roast beef on sourdough and smoked salmon on rye, I asked the woman next to me why she was there. We've come from Singapore because we want to invest. Everyone wants to invest in London. Across the table, a young man approached a group having a meeting. I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself. I'm an investor. What are you up to? He asked. Oh, we're just freeloaders, the more senior in the group replied, laughing before adding. We have developments. Our objective here is to meet politicians and local authorities. It was quite an eye-opener into the frenzied extent of networking, which is undeniably useful for all the key protag protagonists. The problem is one of accountability and transparency with all the deal-making taking place behind closed doors. 
When I asked for a delegate list, I was told there wasn't one. And when I followed this up with new London architecture, I was told it wasn't in a shareable format. As lunch went on, it became very noisy, as the sound of klaxons, chants and a megaphone outside became impossible to ignore, although almost everyone blithely tried to. I walked out of the marquee and into a wall of noise in Berkeley Square. Whistles, police sirens and chants. Here are the people responsible for the housing crisis. Here are the people selling off our land. There are 18 councils here, 15 of them are Labour, a man shouted into a loud hailer. Tell your friends in Hong Kong and China this is what will happen when they invest in London property. It was Simon Elmer from Architects for Social Housing, along with housing campaigners I knew from the Aylesbury Estate in South London, which is under threat of demolition. And I mean, the key issue about the demolition of housing estates is that they are replaced by largely luxury apartments with very minimal amounts of uh, affordable uh, housing. Ace and Dennis, who lives on the Aylesbury and is fighting to save her home, came up to me and said, sorry, I haven't been in touch. I've just wanted to hide recently. As I walked out past the security guards, the protest was intimidating. And when one of the protesters recognised me, she apologised for shouting at me. Once amid the throng of <laughs> protesters, I saw it wasn't threatening. And the noise of the police siren turned out to be more of a joke, activated by a button on the loud hailer. But for most of the delegates, it was surely discomforting. One woman in a smart royal blue dress pushed one of the protesters and was hissed and booed as she walked down the ramp to the marquee before starting to run and falling over. Mostly the well-dressed men, and it was nearly all men, just laughed. But in the most unpleasant incident, a delegate called a protester a poof. After I left the protest, I went back into the high security enclosure of the real estate forum and slipped into another conference session. As I sat down, the heavens opened and, a, and an alarming monsoon-like thunderstorm started hammering down on the roof of the marquee. It's gone a bit quiet on the protester front, the first speaker said to appreciative laughter from the audience, invoking a level of real hostility which seemed to reflect accurately the class war banner of the protesters outside. Well, I feel transported to the marquee in Berkeley <laughs> Square. <laughs> kind of circles that me and Anna are forced to, to move in, eating canapes with local councillors and overseas investors in swanky air-conditioned marquees. But th those worlds are fascinating and, and I think Anna has done an amazing job of, of giving us a kind of insight into how they operate. Um, if, if anyone's been to MIPIM here, which is an even more steroidal version of the London Real Estate Forum in Cannes on the south coast of France, where local authorities actually hand out cakes iced with their council logo. Um, and cocktails on the beach with Croydon, with a cocktail yeah. named after the council chief exec. It's an incredible world. But I suppose you know, that, that's one, one uh, way to depict it and, and one way that protesters would attack it. Um, for a moment, if you put yourself in the council's point of view, um, you know, and you ask them why they're there, and they say, well, we've had our um, capital budgets relentlessly stripped away, more than 60% of our housing grant has gone since the coalition took it away in 2010. You know, the, I, the, I find the longer I spend for local authorities, the more and more sympathy I have for them and, and realise actually this is maybe the impossible position they're, they're being forced to, to be in. You know, flying to Kenya, it sounds like a tough, tough uh, gig, but you know, having to, to look for every possible opportunity to, to squeeze investment I was just wondering if you think maybe um, there could be more scope in parts of your book to give, uh, I suppose, the other side, you know, the, the completely cash-strapped councils, why they're forced to operate in these ways, why they're increasingly behaving like the private sector, um, and what kind of methods they're coming up with to, uh, to provide so-called affordable housing when their capital grant has been so, you know, viciously removed. Yeah, I mean, I, I do... I do give that side. I mean, I do say this is why councils would argue that they're doing it, because they say we don't have any money to build any housing. These partnerships are the only way we can provide new housing. And, you know, I, I certainly do, do say that, but I say it in a, in a sort of, in a, in a way where I say, you know, the councils would say, you know, I, I place myself as clearly unsympathetic to that viewpoint. Because I think when you look at 
what this process actually results in. So, for example, look at the Haygate Estate, which I use as a case study uh, in the book, and it opens the chapter on the demolition of housing estates. So the Haygate Estate was a very large estate in Elephant and Castle, which was home to 3,000 people on predominantly low incomes, but some homeowners as well, perhaps a quarter uh, to a third of homeowners. Mm. Um, and that was demolished in 2014, and it was replaced with uh, the Lendlease, Australian property developer, uh, uh, luxury apartment complex, Elephant Park, which um, includes 2,700 or thereabouts luxury apartments, of which only 82 are social housing. So, I mean, that is like a wholesale economic social change in the demographic. Now and that's the diagram of exactly where those four And this is the were, diagram were of where, where the residents are beyond displaced the to. Of many of them. And the, it's actually the homeowners, Margaret Thatcher's right to buy owners, who get the total worst deal of all because the compensation that they are given for their homes is so little that they can't afford to live in London. So the property developer Lendlease would say, well, we provided 25% of affordable homes in that deal and the council would say how else could we build 25 percent of affordable homes well affordability has been afford, uh, affordable housing has been redefined as up to 80 percent of market rent that was the conservatives redefinition so a two-bedroom apartment in elephant park uh, is on the market for between 750,000 and 1 million pounds so 80 percent of that is allegedly affordable. I mean, that's not affordable, I don't think, to actually the majority of people in this room. So that's what I'd reply to that, yeah, that yeah. these figures, you know, you are not providing housing. You are providing homes for foreign investors, and it's part of the casino economy. And who, in the broader scheme of things, who is the culprit in, in all of this? Cause it's very easy for us to attack greedy developers where you know the viability system allows them to enshrine 20% profit as a cost in their business model, you know, which is greater than any hedge fund would ever give you. Um, and then it's also very easy to attack um, complacent public sector workers, you know, the, the, the planners who've been there for too long, who've lost any sense of being, uh, you know, planners no longer plan, is what we like to say. It's a, become a passive uh, kind of reactive um, discipline where they no longer have a vision, but they just respond to what the market um, brings forward, uh, you know, who, wh where should we be directing our anger? I mean, should we be expecting the private sector to uh, fulfil housing need? I would argue, no, it's not in their interest to do so. It's not profitable. Well, that's, to, this, this um, is it. I mean, there's another graph in the book, which is quite a famous graph in the housing industry, which shows the figures for private sector house building from the post-war period to the present day. Mm. And it has remained actually pretty static at about 150,000 yeah. homes a year. It hasn't changed. And what has changed dramatically is that councils were building between a third to a half uh, additional housing in the post-war period, <coughs> period until 1980 when they stopped and then housing associations were supposed to pick up the shortfall but that really didn't happen in anything like the numbers um, that, that were intended. So this whole idea that the private sector is going to pick it up, they never have done and they never will do because there is a section of housing which operates, which I would say has to be built outside a pure market way. And that's something that, you know, the last 30 years of governments have not been able to consider. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're in the mess that we're in. And at the same time, they've sold off all the social housing we had, the two million council homes we have, we had, and they're continuing to sell it off. Which they're now being forced to rent back through which, housing And benefit, the ridiculous thing is that all of these council homes which were sold off, 40% of those are now rented out by private landlords at three and four times the price, which we as taxpayers are paying for in a massively exponentially soaring housing benefit bill. So the economics don't make sense either. You know, if your argument was economics, you know, this is good for growth, this is good for, you know, GDP, if it was some sort of right wing argument like that, it doesn't make any financial sense. But in terms of who's the culprit, it's the whole framework working together. Is it but called ultimately, the planning system by any chance? Well, it's the failure of the planning system because the planning system, when it was conceived, was conceived in 1947, the modern planning system with the 
uh, Planning Act in 1947, it was conceived with a mechanism that would basically, when you give uh, planning permission for development, it soars in value by 400%. And the whole point of the Planning Act is that it captured those rises in land value uh, for community benefit, in particular housing. So that's how the planning system was supposed to work. Mm. And that is essentially a type of land tax. Uh, uh, land value tax or development land tax or whatever you want to call it and that is in operation all over the world mm. you know lots of uh, they have it in Australia they have it in parts of US, the US they have it in Hong Kong it's not like a socialist thing mm -hmm. it's something that enables the housing market to operate it was actually in the conservative manifesto in our most recent election the was most it? surprising thing really? of all the idea of land value capture which is a great you know, yeah. liberal principle the liberal manifesto um, song they used to have a whole song called the land song about capturing you know value for the community and the Tories nicked it and put it in their latest manifesto. I didn't, I didn't, which I didn't is a, a see kind of that. Shocking thing to appear. I, I, I mean, I think people do know that this is part of the problem, and there have been a number of government reports mm. which have said, you know, we have to look at moving to a land tax. I mean, Churchill supported it, Lloyd George supported it, but actually, it's the house builders and the development industry who are so so against mm. it there's a fascinating bit in your book where you really kind of unpick the progressive erosion of that idea you know from when we had 1967 labor introduced the betterment levy which actually was set at 40 percent of developers profit you know it was automatically taken back for community benefits scrapped by edward heath um, then in 1975, Labour brought in the development land tax, which was set at 80% of the uplift in land value, you know, which now would be unheard of for that, that kind of proportion to be creamed off by the state. And then in the 1990s, you know, we have this kind of completely spineless idea of Section 106, 2008, the community infrastructure levy. Do you think we just need to completely overhaul that idea of, of you know, creaming off these little bits yeah, that we can I mean, it hasn't the worked. private sector? It hasn't worked at all since Section 106 was introduced. And I mean, for people in the audience who don't know, this is a complex and jargonistic term, which is the deal that developers do with, to, with local authorities and say, if you give us planning permission, we'll build a road from the supermarket to... Uh, you know, somewhere else and we'll throw in a sports centre and, you know, we might build some housing. And it simply hasn't worked. You know, it just hasn't provided the housing that, mm -hmm. that we need at all. And yeah, that has, to, that has to completely go. But all of this just requires a wholesale shift in political culture. Are there any local authorities that you came across during your research that do have the right idea, that are bravely either setting up their own housing companies or, you know, kind of taking the initiative and doing it for themselves that could be models for others to follow? Well, I mean, there are there are things that are happening which I think are positive. I mean, I, I'm also quite sceptical of the housing companies. Mm. You know, I think that's a PFI type thing, actually, being snuck in through the back door, although I know you wrote a piece about them. They're um, very different models. We can explain there are them very in, different uh, models, geeky but we don't, we don't want to they're... bore the audience. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, Brighton Council is looking at piloting self-build projects in social housing. I know they're doing that. I know that Sean Berry, who's the Green uh, 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 London Assembly member and is now the Greater London Authority uh, head of the Housing Committee, also wants to work on those sorts of projects. You know, there are small little pockets mm -hmm. of good things going on. I don't really, I didn't really sort of encounter like a Beacon Council who was doing it all really well. I mean, I know Islington is supposed to have a much better record in housing than say Southwark and Haringey mm -hmm. and Kensington and Chelsea. You know, they're not all committing Elephant and Castle, Haringey type situations, but I, I didn't come across a great model. No. I'm slightly more optimistic on, on this topic, just because in 2003, the Local Government Act allowed local authorities to set up private, wholly owned private companies. So they're not actually necessarily partnerships with the private sector, but they're companies that stand separate from the council, in which, of which the council is 100% shareholder. And there are some examples of those where they're actually doing very clever things, borrowing, borrowing from the European Investment Fund and other funds to, to do a proper council-led programme of, of you know, real social housing. So I've, I've got a glimmer of optimism. Okay, I, I, but none I, of it's been I, built I, yet, yeah, so this will I, happen over the next 25 years or, or more. Okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> You'll believe it when you see it. <laughs>
if it happens. I wanted to ask you a bit about community housing as well, because that's something that some people have been championing as the only way of providing truly affordable housing if the land is somehow taken out of yeah, the market, yeah. held in well, a trust I mean, like a community I, land trust. I thought about community oh. land trust long and hard. And mm. I mean, who? what's not to like? You know, it operates outside the market. It's a community-owned land trust. You know, I, I wanted to write quite a bit about this in the final chapter. And, you know, I looked at what was going on and I was asked to write a report about community land trusts about 15 years ago, which I duly did my research and found that there were a few around the country. And I, you know, looking into this now, there are still a few around the country. And although they are like constantly put forward as the answer, you know, at the moment we've got one in London with 24 homes. <laughs> so, I mean, I think this kind of over stressing of like, oh yes, community land trust. Well, the thing about community land trust is that it depends on councils effectively giving the land to the community mm -hmm. land trust for them to be able to operate this outside of the market model. And that is so difficult to achieve. So, you know, if somehow we could kick start public land being gifted for those purposes, then that would be completely different. But that isn't what's happening. So at the moment, you get all the rhetoric and everyone's saying, oh, yes, they're marvellous. But actually, they're hardly doing anything at the moment. Really. I know, and, I, and I know that there are other schemes on the boil and people saying, oh, you know, we've got uh, ideas for a huge one here and there. But, you know, they're very difficult to achieve. Um, can I just ask you about estate regeneration, which has become in, in our world, I suppose, you know, particularly The Guardian, um, a byword for social cleansing, you know, and endlessly. Um, there's a figure, I think, that in London over the past decade, uh, 50 or so estates have been regenerated, which has seen a doubling in the number of homes. So great, you know, good news story, good for growth. And yet at the same time, that represents a loss of 8,000 social rented homes. Um, are there any examples where estate regeneration can be positive, where it's being done well, where it doesn't always necessitate the displacement of existing residents to be on the M25? Well, I mean, there's kind of <laughs> levels of, of, of displacement, shall we say. Um, I mean, I think whenever you demolish a community and you attempt to rebuild them, uh, rebuild you know rebuild something and you know with the best intentions in the world want to rehouse people you know it takes years you will never achieve the same community and you know we've seen this throughout history you know we had the whole slum clearance period and you know if you look for example at biker in newcastle the biker terraces were demolished in the late 60s, I think. And Ralph Erskine, the architect of the new biker, uh, made a huge attempt to rehouse all the residents of the original biker in biker. And, you know, I think he even lived in biker, or he certainly had a, you know, he had a really big presence there, and he was as involved as an architect could possibly be. I mean, one of the big issues today is that architects have very limited involvement, and it's all developer-led, and the architect has to work for the developer. But I think Ralph Erskine did everything he could, and he created a <coughs> great estate that I am a massive fan of. But at the end of all of that, only 17% of the original residents of Biker moved into Biker. So mm. with the best will in the world, you know, whatever you want to call it, demolition, regeneration, whatever, you know, causes huge disruption. And all the evidence that we have is that this is what is happening across London. Now, I know that there are examples of one or two places where actually you know possibly the Packington estate I haven't looked mm, into it yeah, that that's closely that's held up as a model and I don't know if all the residents have returned or what the exact statistics are but essentially this process creates enormous disruption to communities it, it goes with the territory and it's not even necessarily intentional you know great efforts are made mm. That's a question I wanted to ask you actually about intentions, because often, you know, when we're campaigning or, or fighting ag aggressively against what's happening in London, there's a tendency to lapse into a kind of slight conspiracy theory of, oh, well, it's all the councillors, they're in bed with the developers and, you know, chief execs of local authorities going to Cannes and they're all making money out of it. Uh, do you think, you know, that's actually a, a completely misguided argument and that these things are often 
a result of, of very ill thought out policies and unintended consequences? Or is there actually a, a cunning plan behind it all? No, there's no cunning plan. And I don't think anyone sits in a room and says, you know, oh, how can we achieve the most sort of profitable, dreadful development that will, you know, completely change the social composition of our area? But I think that the sort of nexus which drives forward development in cities today, which is local authorities, developers, lobbyists, you know, all meeting up in these kind of private forums and, you know, doing these deals behind mm. closed doors is not a democratic way to make decisions. And I think the, old, the nexus we had in the post-war period also had problems. That was one which was led by local authorities and councils, and there were scandals there as well. And T. Dan Smith and the leader of Newcastle City Council and his PR company and all the housing that he built, you know, and the bad quality construction, you know, all of that gave that period quite a bad mm. name, you know, justifiably. But there was a different spirit present I think where you know if you were a young architect what would you really want to do you'd want to go and build housing social housing it was seen like a sort of wonderful thing to do and you know that's what some of the best people did and you know every local authority had a lead architect mm -hmm. and the London County Council had a lead architect and now the architect isn't really part of the process I mean at an event I did the other day with Jane Rendell from the Bartlett she was talking about how how is it for architects today? They're actually designing homes which are never intended to be lived in. They are actually intended as places of investment. So, you know, Not I don't... Not necessarily by the architect, though. Intended, perhaps, by the, the investor. Well, but okay. I think to implicate architects in a lot of this is, I thought is it was, maybe I, unfair. I, th I thought it was an interesting comment, but I think lots of things come together. I mean, you know, when you look at the space standards mm. in these very expensive new apartments and compare them with, you know, um, yeah. space standards we used to have, you know, they're much smaller, the ceiling heights are much lower, you know, the interiors are just not as well designed. Can we talk about space standards in a bit more depth? Because uh, you know, some people are touting this as the solution to our housing crisis. Actually, we just need to build smaller homes and we can pack in many more onto an existing site. So there's a company called Pocket Living, which lobbied Boris Johnson endlessly to allow a, a smaller minimum space standard than was existing at the time. Uh, a company called The Collective, where you can rent a 12 square metre room for, what is it, it's like a thousand pounds a month and you have access to all these other facilities. Um, do, do you think smaller homes are the way forward? What do you I think, think I can predict your answer. <laughs> but is, is there any um, meat to that argument well, that you can buy that I mean, fit I in just, more houses again, if there's Again, it's, it's like, le it's just this sort of ideological commitment to solving everything through the market and it's just taking us to extremes you know let's design it let, let's sell shoe boxes and we'll solve it that way i mean look at the rest of europe you know they don't live like this they don't have these absurdly high property prices why should we I can answer <laughs> and just finally before i open it up to heckles and questions from the audience um following the grenfell tragedy if, if you had more time now to add another chapter what what kind of things do you think you would be focusing on or if, if you'd even had more time to write the book, full yeah, stop, because yeah, I know yeah, it was yeah. very Yeah, quick. unfortunately, I didn't have as much time as I would have liked. And it wasn't really intended to be a book about the solution to the housing crisis. It was intended to be a book about why we are where we are, how we got here. And that was supposed to help us to think together about how we might move on. But having done a bit of thinking, I think I didn't stress enough I, I mean, I talked a lot about the need to change the planning system and land value tax. I didn't stress enough that we need to find a way of building a substantial amount of housing outside of the market. And I'd like to think more about models around that. And I wonder if there's any mileage in linking that to ideas around basic income, because a lot of the problem is that we're paying for housing through housing benefit mm -hmm. rather than actually building housing. And that's created this very 
complicated inflationary market that I don't really have time to explain here. But actually, housing benefit prices are pushing up rents, which are pushing up rental prices for all of us. So it's not just very difficult for people on housing benefit who can't afford the rent and get evicted and have to move out of London. It's actually pushing up rents for all of us. So, you know, I would like to look at housing outside the market, possibly linking it to basic income, but certainly linking it to building it rather mm-hmm. than paying you know, paying for it through the private rented sector. Yeah, yeah. And the other uh, area I'd really like to look at, I think, is I did look at, again, democratic deficit, but, you know, this issue of accountability and how actually local authorities can be accountable to local communities rather than to developers or the companies who run housing in the area like happened in Kensington Mm -hmm. and you know maybe use that as a starting point for how you know we could approach that differently. Right so we can all look forward to the sequel (laughs) probably out in about two months time knowing the pace at which you can write. No no way. (laughs) Um, There's a roving microphone I think somewhere so does anyone have any questions or points they want to raise? We'll begin or lots one there and then the second one here. Thank you. Is that on? Hello? It's on. Thank you very much uh, to both. On accountability, that last question, um, that last point, my question is, do you think there's any leverage in the court system doing anything about uh, accountability and changing the culture with landmark judgments? I say that because I'm currently taking Haringey Cabinet to judicial review on the Haringey Development Vehicle. I won't go into the detail of that, but we think we have a very strong case to undo their commitment to sell off all the physical assets of the council to a joint venture with Lendlease, no less. So apart from the technicalities of that, which will all come out in the next few months, do you think legal judgments could actually make a significant difference to the policy shift most of us want? Shall I take that now? Oh, yeah, I mean, definitely I do. And you just have to look at what's happened around London. I mean, you're probably familiar with Cressingham Gardens and the Aylesbury, which are both housing estates uh, under threat of demolition. And Cressingham Gardens had a successful judicial review against Lambeth Council. But they then, uh, Lambeth then uh, took them back to court And, I mean, again, the technicalities are incredibly complex, but they failed at their second judicial review. There will be an ongoing legal process there, I suspect. But the Aylesbury was a really shock decision. There was a public inquiry into compulsory purchase uh, at the Aylesbury, compulsory purchase being the homes that the right-to-buy owners are called leaseholders. Um, they've bought, and then the council has off- offers them you know, what's normally very low values for their properties. And in the case of the Aylesbury, they were incredibly low, some of the values, you know, 70,000 for homes in Elephant and Castle. And to everyone's amazement, the leaseholders actually won that public inquiry and that has been halted. Now the process will go on and you know again there's all sorts of you know the council are still fighting it and it's a nightmare for the leaseholders but I think there's a lot of mileage in the legal route and you know I think a lot of our institutions are suffering from a democratic deficit actually not least of all journalism But the legal system, you know, actually less so perhaps. And I think there's a lot of mileage in that. The difficulty for you, obviously, is that, you know, you and everyone else involved in it will spend, you know, 24 hours a day working on this and you will work incredibly hard. And but yes, I think it it could well do well. And it often comes down to who has the most expensive lawyers, which in public sector versus a developer, you can guess. But, you know, you should talk wins. to the Cressingham Garden pe- Gardens people because they are incredibly good. Mm. And the team they have, you know, they have lawyers, they have barristers, they have a whole bunch of people who are, who are really great. And, you know, I'm sure they would like to talk to you. The second question was just here. Oh, thank you. Um, hello. I just wanted to ask what you thought about estate densification. <clears throat> and I thought it was interesting that you mentioned Islington because I know that they have a borough architects department and they're doing at least two schemes at the moment to intensify or sorry, densify a 
estates. One is the Andover estate, and I can't remember the name of the other one. Um, obviously, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's preferable to demolition, but it's still the low-income communities which are bearing the brunt of all the, their amenities being <coughs> taken over. And often these estates are really quite well designed, so like at Central Hill or Cressingham Gardens, they're really beautifully landscaped. And you <coughs> obviously lose that facility if you live there. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the places I visit towards the end of the book, Central Hill, which is an incredibly beautiful estate, just in the most amazing location in Gypsy Hill, looking out all over London, and you can see, you know, the land values there, absolutely enormous. And actually, architects for social housing have suggested this plan for, you know, what's called infill, where they do add lots of uh, properties which essentially would pay for themselves through sales of the new properties and none of the old properties would be lost and yes I mean I think while in a perfect world you know the way these estates are designed is probably the way they should stay you know the the, the really good ones um, I'm I'm very in favor of that as a, as a as a way to look at things but councils are not and it's partly because of tax. Again, it comes back to VAT. Yeah, yeah. So there's 20% VAT on refurbishment, but not on demolition. So if that, it's a simple change, yeah. you know, that could be made. If that was changed, then the whole incentive for demolition, which also adds like so much CO2, totally unsustainable sol <laughs> solution, you know, it would change. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the house builders, you know, who, I mean, you know, they just won't allow it. Mm. But there are some examples where, you know, clever kind of surgical infill and overbuilding has improved an estate. It hasn't just sheerly added density, but it's, you know, made them more kind of permeable, to use the word that architects love to use. It's created active frontages along the street. It's, it's fixed some of the problems with And it the, fits the with that whole idea of, a, you know, I'm not sort of set one for saying the city shouldn't change you know, and it should be a museum, you know, preserved in aspect, you know, the needs of the city change, and it fits with that idea of an organically changing city. That's very different from a, you know, scorched earth, yeah. let's demolish everything. More questions? On there. Thanks. I've enjoyed the discussion. Um, isn't the fundamental problem here, though, a political one and a lack of political will? So all of the complexity of the problem that you describe about overseas investors, the buy-to-let market run wild, um, that by you know legislation, these things could change. And it's not as if politicians don't understand this or recognize that there's a problem, irrespective of their party. But for me, isn't it that fundamentally this inflated housing market uh, that the economy is kind of predicated on that and that politicians are afraid of introducing legislation that in any way mm. could damage this inflated housing market where there are so many vested interests which although it may solve some of the problems you're describing could potentially have huge economic consequences in terms of consumption and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think you've raised a really important point and after I finished the book, I also thought... I should have written a bit more about that and the fear that's probably underlying the paralysis, which is that our whole economy is predicated on property finance. So if we don't have that, what do we have? And actually to sort of try and sort of manage the kind of, you know, graduated change away from that, I think would have to be part of like any sort of serious look at solutions and yeah I mean I think I think you've raised a massive point but I mean I think that there are things that can be done you know and what's likely to happen instead is that we've got this structural instability in our housing market which means that we're probably gonna head for a crash you know I mean that's what people are sort of widely talking about because we've got this speculative house building model which is all about prices going up, up, up and up. And now, you know, they've reached a point where everyone says, well, they're likely to come down. But, you know, when you have things like off-plan sales where, mm. you know, you buy homes before they've even build, been built but you only buy 5% of it, you know, obviously when the housing market crashes, those investors are just going to run away and they it's won't have bought... already in, in Exactly, exactly. So... I mean, I think you have raised a really important point, but at the same time, some of the things that are going on now are really structurally unsound anyway. So I think there's also a kind of, 
I don't know, inflexibility. I think this kind of dogma about only looking at market solutions, it's kind of mystifying yeah. to me. And a lot of the pre-sales investors, yeah, that's what they call it before it's even started construction, are desperately trying to offload the things they bought you know, five years ago back to the developer. So you can now go to Battersea Power Station and I'll say, you're just in time to buy one of Frank Gehry's you know, two million pound two bed apartments. You can be just the second owner, you know, which is quite unusual because often these things are sold again and again and again before they reach the final. But owner. I mean, off plan um, sales should be banned. You know, because that's creating a pyramid selling scheme. But it's also political, I think, with a small p, given that the, the biggest obstacle, I think, is the property owning class, you know, because everyone's so paranoid about their own investment being damaged. So it's not just, you know, the politicians, it's, it's everyone of, yeah. Well, I think that's true to some extent, but as a member of the property owning okay, class I've myself. Okay, I've yet to reach that stage, so tell me what it's like. Um, well, it's probably a lot better than you know, my friend's situation who, you know, I was lucky because I had a job, you know, 20 years ago and, you know, I, I got a £5,000 deposit and I bought a flat, which, you know, was less than £100,000 and is now worth seven times as much. Um, but, you know, as a member of some, you know, I, I, own, I own a property, I would be happy to take a hit. I'm sure a lot of people would be happy to take a hit rather than live on a false economy. And then, of course, there's the kids of the property-owning class as well. Mm -hmm. You know, all these parents aren't very happy that their children have nowhere to live. Well, the bank of mum and dad has been highlighted as one of the most iniquitous parts of, uh, you know, propping up this insane economy. The, the next question was there, and then we'll take one here. Oh, sorry, Emma. Thank you, Anna. And a, a really great book. A shocking read, but a great read. And it's interesting that you launched it just a few streets away from where the St Pancras housing riots took place in the 60s, or 1960 to be precise. So, you know, the, this, these troubles have been here before. I've got lots of questions, but the one I wanted to, to ask you to talk about tonight is you mention about what I call the middle class investors from other countries. I think you specifically refer to the Chinese. Um, coming into East London, which we know was where the GLA decided affordable housing would be built um, rather than across the city, um, how much of that is really distorting and taking off the market or rise, raising prices for those other people who may be of our cultures that actually want to live here? I mean, I don't quite understand the economics of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I can't give you sort of specific figures or a specific percentage. But I do know, as you probably do as well, Ollie, that a lot of properties are just marketed directly in, you know, Southeast Asia, mm. China, well before they come anywhere near East London or actually other parts of yeah, London. But not but even I think, new builds. I, I think terraces of, of you know houses all over the country. So, so I mean, that is a it is a it is a massive phenomenon, and um, I worked with someone actually. Um, I I run a course at the University of London on all of this, by the way. If anyone wants to come on it, <laughs> postgraduate course starting in September. Uh, but um, I had an artist in residence uh, last year, and he found a film that Newham had produced, Newham Council, for the Shanghai Expo. And it was called uh, Newham's Regeneration Supernova. <laughs> it's the most ludicrous film you will ever see. I mean, it's like, you know, rockets and, you know, kind of a map of, like, the arc of opportunity. And, um, you know, and then it has, like, a red telephone box. And then it says, you know, three hours from Paris, six hours from New York, you know, Newham. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, in, in, in answer to your question, you know, yes, they're marketing very heavily out there. Exactly the percentage of investment, I, I don't exactly know. But yes, it's a big part of what's going on. Can we take the one right at the back and then? I mean, the problem with this is that quite a lot of this is funny. You know, like that film is hilarious. You know, the real estate property forum is hilarious, but it's not funny. It's like... <laughs> Hi, I'll be quick. This isn't really a question, but I'm, I'm, I work for the National Community Land Trust Network, so I am completely biased with community <laughs> housing. Um, but we are seeing so much interest at the moment, and we're definitely not promoting it as the solution to the housing crisis, but definitely a solution. Um, there is actually more than one CLT in London. Um, 
So there's um, St Anne's, um, London CRT, and Lewisham with Rust as well. So it's definitely a very popular but thing. But Rust hasn't built anything yet, has no, it? No, but it's um, got the land and that's okay. happening. Okay, no, look, I'm, I'm not doing it down. I, I think it's a great <laughs> solution. It's just that I thought long and hard about it. And I just thought, because it's always being presented as the answer, that's my problem with it. You know, when you've got such a massive crisis and people answer the, you know, when their pol politicians are faced with, what are you going to do? And they go, community land trust. <laughs> You know, that, that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. But, of course, I'm, I'm very happy about St Anne's and um, Russ. There's 3,000 units across London, right, in the pipeline, if you, yeah. if you count Brixton Green and Camley Street and all those. Yeah, so, you we're, know, we're it's, it's ramping up. Well, it's, it's very important, but, you know, 3,000 homes. Oh, yeah, it's nothing, but it's They were lost in, was. at the Haygate in one fell swoop. But, yes, I'm not... I'm not at all oppositional. I think CLTs are great. <laughs> was that one? Was it? No? Oh, sorry. Fine. Yeah. Um, a question and a, a comment. Thank you for the, uh, the great talk. Um, I thought your point about kind of, I guess, getting homeowners on board, you know, on the same side as renters was a really important one and interesting. I think it's perfectly possible, especially in this day and age when Theresa May has, you know, talked about confiscating people's owned homes to pay for their social care and, as you said, with the, the Haygate people um, who, who bought their council homes, um, um, getting nothing for them. Um, the, the, the question really was about um, uh, the current political situation in terms of the Labour Party and um, Corbyn. Um, which I, I think is a, a fantastic, hopeful development, and, and what you think of, um, of of the of the the leadership's housing policies in terms of um, both building new council homes and the, the talk of requisitioning after Grenfell, which I think is very interesting. Um, and, and given the number of empty properties there are, and, you know, Danny Dawling said that, that we have now more empty rooms per head of population than ever uh, before. So, yeah, wondering your thoughts on that, those kind of new developments. Okay, I mean, I've got a few thoughts on this. I'd say sort of what I've seen of Labour's housing policies so far quite sketchy. I mean, I don't know what Ollie thinks. Well, I mean, I also didn't, didn't they also do a big review of housing policy headed up by the head of Taylor Wimpy? Maybe, as well as a very well worked out housing okay. policy by it, John Healy that was fully costed and I think very convincing. Personally. I mean, what I, I my, my main concern is... I mean, I, I, as I say, I'm very keen to see house building outside of the market, and I'm not entirely sure what models are being proposed here. Um, but my main concern is that Labour councils have been at the forefront of the estate demolition agenda, and Jeremy Corbyn hasn't said anything about this. And what I hope is that he's had a lot of battles to fight, and, you know, he's picked his battles because he doesn't want to take on all of these Labour councils, a lot of which are quite powerful right-wing Labour councils. Um, but if he doesn't say something about all of this, and, for example, Haringey, which has been in the news so much recently, soon, I think it's going to start to become quite a major issue. And Sadiq Khan has indicated that he's quite OK with estate regeneration and he doesn't actually think tenants should get ballots on it either. Um, so I have some severe question marks about Labour's housing policy. I think it remains to be seen. I personally, I just think it's refreshing that there's a shadow housing minister who's interested in housing, who, you know, for whom it's a, a hobby in his free time, not a kind of thing he's been given to look after. And, and he's written, you know, endless, very thorough reports showing how councils, if the borrowing cap was lifted, how it would be eminently possible to build, you know, thousands of homes. Yeah, it just needs that political will. So yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic, personally. Next one here, and then... Would we'll ask him next. Do you, I presume you interview him now and again. Ask him about the estate, estate regeneration, regeneration issue. See what I mean. I yeah, yeah. No, you're right. They've so been hopeful. far too silent on that. There, there was one. Two last questions together. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I don't really have a question. I'm just sort of so aware of just like how emotional I feel sitting here. 
um, like it's sort of I I'm not sort of I understand the statement about it makes you want to laugh I, mean, I do really understand that I'm not trying to sort of shame you by saying that I I just don't feel like that I don't feel any humor I feel heartbreak I think what this issue really is about is losing a city that's what is happening I feel like I I'm losing and people like me and I, I really do I mean I feel this every day a losing a city that's what's actually happening and we're losing a city out of capitalism and greed basically that's what's going on and it's a major crisis and I know it's global as well or it's I don't know if it's global I know it's happening in the US and and other places like that as well and I can't believe you know that Labour are doing nothing about it. It's absolutely it's just shameful and disgusting. And it's happening daily all around you. you just, it's part of living in London. You're saying, oh, that's gone, or they're gone, or, or, that, or that security is gone. I never, I never dreamt in my life that we'd actually lose those disgusting county council estates that I grew up on. You know, that it would actually, that would become the bloody issue, you know? This is what it is for me. I mean, I think this is an issue that like, I have to look at a lot because I teach quite a depressing course. <laughs> you know, it's called Reading the Neoliberal City. Yeah. And I've written quite a depressing book. And obviously there were times in that book, some of the stories, we haven't talked about them today, but you know, some of the families who've been like forced to leave London and some of the places they've ended up in and some of the conditions are really heartbreaking and it was quite hard to do that. But I mean I think that you know there's a brilliant um quote by um you know amazing guy died earlier this year. He had an event at the LLB bookshop as it happens. God, his name's just gone straight. Yeah, John Berger, about hope. And I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something about hope being a form of energy rather than, you know, something that's necessarily going to happen. And actually, you know, if you just start to let it all kind of, you know, just get on top of you and just say this is all so dreadful and, you know, it's... You know, it's not just on top of you, it's the carpet's pulled up from under your feet. Yeah, well... That's what's happening. I mean, your life's transformed by it. Look, we're not we're not in a state of war. I mean, perhaps some people on council estates are actually. Grenfell I mean, I would say Grenfell it? or the people I interviewed on the Aylesbury and the sort of places that they're putting up with, you know. But terrible things happen. War didn't get rid of us. This is the... all I'm saying is I think we have to try to stay hopeful, despite how difficult circumstances can be. And I wish I could remember the John Berger quote because it's a great one. I'll look it up later. But yeah, just to emphasise, the book doesn't treat these topics lightly at all. No, we we, we no, haven't no, gone into it, but there are some incredibly yeah. kind of harrowing bits yeah. about the Dickensian conditions. And I do also, you know, end on a chapter called The Right to the City where I do try to put forward solutions. And I think another thing that, you know, we sort of get into a mindset where we think things are going to stay the same forever. You know, oh, you know... I'll never be able to afford a house. House prices will always be like this. Well, it hasn't always been like no, this. Revolution you know, will things happen. are kind of constantly changing. The final point before I think we have to wrap up. Um, was it? Where was it? Is that right? Well, I was going to ask you a question, but I think it's much better to end on an emotional one. So, because <laughs> mine's a rather technical question, I'm not to answer. Okay. <laughs> Do you mean to? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, 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 obviously the no, comments. There was a, did you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hold the clapping, hold the clapping. Um, no, of course, the last um, observations and comments are absolutely, I think, what we all feel here. I mean, everyone, whether they're a, a property owner, whether they're renting socially, privately, whether they're looking on, passing through the city, is um, aware of the profound changes that the city is um, undergoing, and it, it can't be good for the human beings who live in it uh, in the short, middle, or long term. And so we have to find ways, of course, to resist this and to think about alternatives. And I think the crucial thing, the hope that I would draw from John Burge's, of course, writing, absolutely, but from Anna's 
uh, mention and, uh, and quotation of John Berger is that, of course, we need the tools in which, with which to do so. Many of these issues are buried deep in paperwork, where the actual crucial implications of, of policy um, need to be unpicked by people who know uh, about this, uh, this way of working. And we're, I think we're all blessed and privileged that people like Oliver Wainwright and Anna Minton are working on our behalf to actually understand the crucial implications of policy that would certainly pass way over my head uh, until, of course, that head uh, was facing directly the bullets of the implication of the policy. So I think we must hold on to this. We must hold on to this, these tools of working. I mean, this is basically what this bookshop is about, what the London Review books are, is about, what The Guardian is about. We need to support these structures that allow investigation and proper critical inquiry into these crucial issues that affect us all. So that's what this event is about. I think I find hope in this event. I find hope in the writers who are presenting here and, of course, in the audience who is attending. So if we could hold on to that, personally, I would feel that we have at least a small way of, of thinking about possible futures. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank everyone here at the London Review Bookshop for making the event possible, of course. But please do now thank for their events tonight, of course, their conversation tonight, their books and writing, Oliver Wainwright and Anna Minton. Thank you very much.